by um, by the way that we look at it, or in reality? No, it's this. This is not an intellectual process. Of, although there is a role for the intellect, as we discussed last time with self inquiry, mm. uh, it has a rather important role in later stages, and it is very closely linked with with the flow of bhakti, which is the flow of our heart and our emotions toward our chosen ideal. But but it's not intellectual. It's not something we conjure up, um, an it's attitude that we can invent. It's something that occurs as our inner functioning changes, as our inner functioning becomes more pure. We have more stillness. We have abiding inner silence. We have some ecstasy moving within that silence. And then that ecstasy and that silence become joined somehow, and it flows out of us as love. So that's what I mean. On an um, energetic level. It is, yeah, it's, it's not something you, uh, you invent. It's something that happens to you in mm -hmm. your neurobiology from practices. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, it flows out through your mental activity, which becomes more inquiring. Uh, it flows out through your heart, which greatly expands your bhakti. Uh, people who do spiritual practices, their bhakti just keeps expanding and expanding and expanding, and it just overflows into the world. So karma becomes, a, in terms of, is it good or is it bad or, you know, what's going to happen to me today or whatever, it becomes a pretty small, uh, almost insignificant aspect of the overall picture mm -hmm. because all of our karma becomes um, swept up in that flow of divine love. And then that's what makes the difference in how we personally will express that divine flow. You know, some people, their karma is to be more introspective, and so maybe those people will be more in the retreats, you know, working in the retreats or be writers <laughs> yeah, <we> were, <laughs> or whatever. And yeah. then people who are more extroverted, they may go out and be helping people by the thousands and the millions, you know? Yes. Uh, th those are the karmic differences in spiritual teachers. It is, it is their karma that determines how they're serving humanity. We were talking right. about sin earlier, and now what would you say sin is? Well, I think sin is something that's defined either in our mind or by our uh, whatever institution we're subjected to. Um, so if it's in our mind... It's, it's, a, it's really a concept. Uh, right. I mean, if we, if we look at what sin is... Sin is obviously referring to the consequence uh, of means, an action we took at some yes. time in the past, which is just karma. Right. Now, if, if the karma is going to be bad, then that's some people will come along and say, well, you've sinned, so you're going to have this, as you sow, so shall you reap, right. to put it in Christian terms. So that's, that's sin. But that's somebody defining what your karma is. Um, but as you're engaged in spiritual practices, and, and in, again, in the Krishna terminology, if you're totally surrendered to your God and you've uh, been forgiven, uh, you know, that sin is washed away. That's sort of the Christian metaphor for it. But in yoga, what we're doing is we're, is we're working from inside and we're, we're blasting all of those obstructions, uh, those negative tendencies that are in us with inner silence and ecstasy. So the sin, if you will, or the negative karma, if you will, is being literally uh, bathed in the light, bathed in the light. And so then it becomes a vehicle for divine uh, flow and divine action. So sin, sin, is, con sin is conceptual. I, I would say that sin is what we have before we have begun to transcend our karma. Okay, and so if we have done something that is sinful, you know, in reality, but my mind is saying is uh, oblivious to it, does that mean that I don't get the karma for it if I don't see it as a negative? No, I don't think it means that at all. I, I think our actions uh, create a potential consequence in our nervous system and, and in the broader fabric of, uh, of existence. But how that how that expresses will be determined by your spiritual condition. Okay. Okay. So, so uh, you know, that's that's 
that's uh, that's how I understand it, and that's been my experience. Uh, so, what part, what role does service have to play on this path to enlightenment and karma? Washing out the negative karma? No, it's it's not that uh, it's not that uh, dis- discreet. You know, it's yes. not like uh, if I do this, I'm going to get rid of that. Yes. Uh, that's sort of the transactional approach to spiritual development, which is a totally bogus, you know. Yes. If you do this, you're going to get that. It's sort of, That's totally on the level of the mind. And service, uh, people may begin in service with that, with that uh, idea, but right. in fact, service is something that flows naturally from within, and, and true service comes from within silence and the divine flow that comes out of it. So I view service as a product of the transcendence of karma and limiting, limiting, uh, constricting uh, energies and obstructions in our nervous system. But service is also a spiritual path, and some people are drawn to it early, and some people are drawn to it later. But I think if someone is on a spiritual path, and inner silence is coming up, and those obstructions are being removed, then service becomes a, both the path and the outcome mm-hmm. uh, in later stages, especially. Kind of similar to self-inquiry. You know, self-inquiry is a great inspiration in the, uh, you know, non-duality, uh, non-dual existence, and the oneness of everything is very inspirational at the beginning of our path. But self-inquiry, which is the way to unfold that, really doesn't have much practical value until later on when we have cultivated inner silence in our nature and we have the witness separate from thoughts. Likewise, service um, will be more natural and flowing and evolutionary when we have that inner flow starting to occur. So I view self-inquiry and service as being really coming into their own later in the path, which isn't to say people would not be drawn to them earlier, but it's definitely not a transaction. <laughs> definitely no, not. No, no. Because by the time you get to real service, you're not concerned with the outcome. No. But real real bhakti, real, real karma yoga is not concerned with the outcome. It's concerned with doing for the other. What, um, what would for you no s- other reason than the doing. Yes, what w- would you like to say about right action? Well, um, I think we have a need for some some definition of right action, uh, and in yoga it's called yama and niyama, uh-huh. restraints and observances, simply so that when people have not mat- matured spiritually, that they will be have restrictions from injuring others. You know, that's why we have the law. So I think we we need the law so that action can be regulated enough so people's, uh, uh, how should we say, undeveloped condition will not be a hazard to others. Yes. Um, I think right action, uh, right action for one who is on the spiritual path and doing spiritual practices, it naturally evolves, independent of any law or outside regulation. And everyone who meditates finds this, because what happens is, as you have more presence and more inner silence, and you commit an act that is, quote-unquote, not a right action, like harming someone else, you feel it more than the person yes. you're doing it to. Yes. It is extremely painful. So spiritual practices cultivate right action because you become the other. You become the other person. And whatever you do to him, you're doing to yourself, Mm -hmm. even worse. Mm -hmm. So um, right action, we can define it in terms of the law, like I was just saying, or we can also view it as a natural outcome of spiritual practices. Okay.